All right, show of hands, everybody. How many of you love and care about your neighborhoods and want to make them better? Everybody. Awesome. That means I can give this talk I prepared. <laughs> our cities and our communities are defined by the interaction of people and places. But who shapes the built environment around us? We walk around our cities and we say, oh, look, they're building that new project over here. Or why haven't they built anything here yet? Who are they? Why is it they and not we? Too often, developers in low-income neighborhoods have profit rather than the community's best interest as their motivation. This creates anger and distrust between communities and developers. In many low-income neighborhoods, there's little or no new development because the private market won't support it. People live in places without grocery stores or other basic services, both wishing for new development to come and fearing gentrification at the same time. We look around us and we think of the buildings and real estate as something that's too big, too complex, too expensive for us to influence. And I believe that this creates an unequal and unjust power dynamic where communities don't feel like they can influence their own future. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but I don't think it has to be this way, and I don't think it should. My first job out of college was working for this guy, James L. Brown IV. He's a community developer in the Parkside neighborhood of West Philadelphia who spent over 40 years redeveloping these blighted, abandoned, historic mansions into hundreds of units of affordable housing. It now looks like this. I learned a lot working for Mr. Brown about how hard it is to build in low-income neighborhoods. Each of these projects took years to convince banks to invest in such a distressed area. And they were only possible because of this complex structure that combined financing and two different federal tax credit programs. In the end, he restored over 20 mansions, uh, over 200 units of affordable and special needs housing. But Parkside is really the exception, not the rule, for low-income neighborhoods with beautiful but distressed historic buildings. And this neighborhood today needs so much more. Even now, Parkside has a poverty rate of close to 40%. So I came away from that job saying to myself, something's wrong here. It can't take this long and be this complicated. We have to figure out a better way to build projects that are important to our communities. I'm thinking about projects like affordable housing, or a neighborhood grocery store, a public health clinic, artist studios, or job training. What these all have in common is that they're not just buildings. These are buildings which are there in order to bring important services and programs that make our communities stronger and improve people's lives. These types of projects are usually built by three different types of groups. There are community development corporations, nonprofits created with the goal of strengthening their neighborhoods, like New Kensington CDC who built the Coral Street Arts project shown here. And then there are nonprofits who don't typically build real estate but need physical buildings in order to deliver programs and services, like Please Touch Museum, who in 2005 restored the historic Memorial Hall building into their new museum home. And then there are some private developers who have multiple bottom lines and see the, uh, the importance of investing in low-income neighborhoods. Oftentimes, these developers collaborate with local nonprofits and community development corporations, like the Jonathan Rose Companies, who partnered with community development corporation APM to build Paseo Verde, this affordable housing, retail, and public health project along transit up by Temple University. These types of projects are just one piece of the community development puzzle, but I think it's a really important piece, and it's one that we should pull out and focus on. I call these types of projects social impact real estate, and I believe that they're critical to the future of our cities, our communities, and ultimately our society. A few years later after that, after that Parkside job, I worked for another community development corporation in West Philadelphia called the Enterprise Center CDC. We uh, redeveloped this 13,000 square foot building, which is located on an existing commercial corridor, and when we bought this building, the roof was caving in, bricks were falling off, the windows were cracked and boarded up. It created an impossible situation 
for the businesses struggling to survive alongside it. It took a while, but we transformed this building into the Dorrance H. Hamilton Center for Culinary Enterprises, a business incubator for food businesses, with state-of-the-art commercial kitchens for entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses, a classroom training kitchen providing programs for entrepreneurs and the community alike, and new retail, including the neighborhood's first full-service sit-down restaurant. In order to make this project possible, we had to cobble together funding from 11 different financing sources. I'm extremely grateful to all of these funders, which included federal, state, and city grants, low-interest loans, and foundation grants. I'm grateful to them for sharing the vision and for seeing this project through with us. But it took years to piece all of this together. It was difficult to coordinate between all these different funding sources. And there were definitely times along the journey <clears throat> where I thought, that this project was just going to fall apart. And I got to the end and I said to myself, there has to be a better way. A couple of years ago, I went up to Toronto and I met with Nick Saul, the dynamic founder of The Stop, an innovative community center combined with a food bank. We went up and visited Witchwood Barns, uh, this project shown here. It's an impressive renovation of a 60,000 square foot building into live-work housing for artists, a community center, a greenhouse, and a whole bunch of other cool uses. We walked around and we watched as kids learned about where their food came from and baked in an outdoor pizza oven. And I turned to Nick and I said, so how did you finance this thing? And he said, you know, how do we ever finance these types of projects? By hook or by crook? <laughs> well, <clears throat> that statement really resonated with me. It was such an apt description of this haphazard process that we use to build these projects that are the most important ones for our communities. The problem at its core is that the whole system for how we finance and build real estate is designed for projects with low risk and high return. What do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> the normal way that you do this is that you take out a mortgage secured by a building based on its appraised value. And then you take out a loan from a bank, guaranteed by the developer, and repaid by the project's cash flow. Well, for social impact developers, this creates a challenging, if not impossible, situation. Because in low-income neighborhoods, the building might not appraise high enough. The developer might not have the assets to guarantee the loans. And because of the nonprofit uses, the project might not generate enough cash to repay those loans. There are some tools that we have to try and fill in the gaps, like foundation and government grants, low-interest loans and tax credits. But there's not nearly enough grant dollars to go around. Tax credits are complicated and expensive, so that only the most savvy groups can use them. And then there's the point I made before, that all of these sources act individually and need to be coordinated, and it's complicated and time-consuming and challenging. So, in my current role, I help nonprofits try and figure this stuff out. My organization, American Communities Trust, works with nonprofits around the country to help them build and finance social impact real estate. In Louisville, we partnered with a nonprofit called Seed Capital Kentucky, a group with smart uh, and passionate people focused on building a resilient regional food economy. And we're going to transform this 24 acre site the former home of the American Tobacco Factory, now a contaminated brownfield, located in one of the city's poorest neighborhoods, into the West Louisville Food Port, a complex of for-profit businesses, nonprofits, and government programs focused around building and growing the regional food economy and connecting fresh local food with the city's neighborhoods. In St. Louis, we partnered with a local nonprofit to breathe new life into the historic Carr School, this building sat vacant for over 30 years in North St. Louis, but we're going to turn it into a hub of innovation, workforce training, and entrepreneurship focused around the life sciences and tech for the low-income residents of North St. Louis. In Baltimore, we partnered with several nonprofits to redevelop a three-and-a-half-acre campus in East Baltimore into a culinary center similar to the one I worked on in Philadelphia, but much larger and with a social enterprise business that's going to provide on-the-job training for low-income residents in the surrounding neighborhoods.
This is going to be run by an experienced nonprofit called Humanum. And then in Providence, Rhode Island, we helped Clinica Esperanza build and develop out their new home. And today, this free nonprofit public health clinic provides services for over 2,500 uninsured people a year. The work that we're doing is important, and I believe that we are helping these nonprofits through a very complex process. But each of these projects are still extremely challenging and haphazard because at the end of the day, the basic system hasn't changed. It makes sense for private developers to be out there on their own, piecing these projects together in a competitive marketplace where if they succeed, they reap financial return. But that system doesn't make a lot of sense to me for projects where the end goal is to improve our communities. The status quo where we expect social impact projects to work under the same system as private profit-based development is just all wrong. These projects have totally different uh, requirements and goals. It's apples and oranges. And so <clears throat> the answer isn't to gradually change the existing system or create a new tax credit or a new grant. No. The system is broken. It doesn't work. The solution is that we need to radically change the system and create a new one that values collaboration rather than competition. We need a system that supports both developers building for profit and those building for good. And we need a system that ultimately works to bring those worlds closer together. This new system would value collaboration, simplicity, and shared responsibility. The first thing we need to do is change the way that projects are funded in low-income neighborhoods. Instead of having all these individual funding sources and the developers on their own to piece it together, we need a coalition of funders and partners who work together to reward great projects and programs. They would share the investment risk, and ultimately, they would work together with these community developers and share the responsibility for seeing the projects through to completion. This is such a dramatically different way of doing things than the way that we do now. This coalition could help change other pieces of the system that also need to change. Having the buy-in of this coalition could help bring important institutions to the table, like universities and civic-minded for-profit corporations that could outvalue and help move the project along and strengthen the outcome. They could help to better align current programs to fit the needs of social impact projects. They cr could create new financing tools to help fill in the gaps and maybe most importantly of all, they could help connect sources of private capital with social impact projects. There's this whole new world of impact investing out there, but these social impact community developers don't know how to access it. We need new marketplaces to connect this private capital with worthy mission-based projects. This new system isn't just going to benefit nonprofits. There are for-profit developers working in low-income neighborhoods to build social impact projects as well. And the secret is that these projects share more commonalities with nonprofit projects often than they're different. These for profit projects in low income neighborhoods often need lots of grants and low interest loans and tax credits in order to make them possible. I just read in the news today, this morning, so I don't have a slide for it, but the developer of the Divine Lorraine up on Broad Street got the final piece of his financing that he needs to move that project forward. It's a grant that he's coupling together with millions of dollars of other grants and tax credits in order to make this important for-profit project go. <clears throat> There's a good um, socially minded developer based in Baltimore called Seawall Development who's taking a really strategic approach to rebuilding the Remington neighborhood in their hometown. And they were also a partner on this project shown here, Oxford Mills, which provides affordable housing for teachers. There's another for-profit developer who I want to highlight called Shift Capital, who acquired the Bewery building up even farther on North Broad Street. Some people call this the other Divine Lorraine. <clears throat> it's a very challenging, very low-income neighborhood, and this project is going to take a lot of support and collaboration to bring to the finish line. And so with this new system in place, projects like this can more easily move forward and benefit their low-income communities. And if we put this new system in place, the result is that we're going to have more private development in low-income neighborhoods of higher quality, 
partnering with nonprofits, community development corporations, and local partners, working around a shared vision towards our neighborhood's future. Imagine that. The problem isn't that there's not a need for these projects, it's not that there aren't developers who want to build them, and it's not that there aren't vacant lots and abandoned buildings that need to be restored. The problem is that the system just doesn't work. It's broken, it's not working, and we need to fix it. I know you're sitting out here saying, I care about my neighborhood, but I'm not a developer. How can I be part of this? This isn't for me. Well, my lesson for you to take away is that this is for you. This is for all of us who care about our neighborhoods. We can be part of this solution. And I want to give you a real life example of someone uh, who's sitting in the audience here today. I want you to meet my friend Chris Scott. Chris lives in Parkside, that neighborhood I talked about before with a 40% poverty rate. He bought street trees for everyone on his block. He renovated a neighborhood park and recently, he brought together a bunch of residents and neighborhood stakeholders and got free legal assistance from a big law firm and they're incorporating and creating a new community development corporation that's going to be committed to rebuilding Parkside, building on its vacant lots and abandoned buildings and making this change happen. I'm really proud of you, Chris, wherever you are. <laughs> there are lots of others out there like Chris, this next generation of community development leaders who are fed up and frustrated with the slow pace of change, who believe that we can do so much better for our neighborhoods. And so let's stop waiting for them to come and rebuild our communities. It's time for us to get together, to change the system, and to start building this bright future for our communities that we all know is possible. Thank you.